Mike, check one, two. Good evening. This is Dr. Garayas. This is Tuesday, July 6, the makeup uh, class. Uh, several of you already called in uh, and checked into yesterday, June, July 5th. There were several announcements that we don't have a class on July 5th because of the holiday. Um, um, those of you who show any activity for yesterday uh, will get attendance. If I see no activity for July 5th uh, or today, uh, and remember things are due, so um, I can only award attendance to those who uh, submitted stuff. So what's due, this is week seven. Um, uh, module six items, which of course is your medical language laboratory for, um, let's look into here. I don't know the chapter right off the bat. For, da, 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 drum roll please, for the renal or urinary system, of course, these items. Right, welcome, welcome. Ms. Harmon, how you doing? Um, so that's what's due today. Of course, the quiz, uh, and there's no discussion forum uh, what did I put here? Uh, because last week is this week's or... Oh no, I actually put one. So if you did one last week or this week, you're gonna get credit. And what do you essentially do? And so we can have it on video. So I'm gonna to pretend to be you, the student. And let's say um, I finished up module six so I'm gonna look at the renal chapter. Oopsies, go to my ebook. Almost slipped up and showed you grades. That's no bueno. Okay, those of you who logged in, welcome, welcome. And I'm just uh, showing the example because uh, uh, some people called in over the weekend on how exactly are you to do um, uh, the quizzes. I gave you an example, but I'm gonna walk you right through it. Let's see if uh, our textbook is cooperating with us. I don't know what is going on. Give it a minute. Come on, I need this to work. Got stuff to do. Okay, running down. There you go. Or maybe not. Okay, so you go into the table of contents and let's say I want to do urinary system. You could do digestive, cardiovascular, whatever, right? I want to find a case. When I click on digestive system, you see all the way at the bottom where it says medical record activities. I click on that and I look at the first one. So let's look at uh, this guy, Herman Knowles. Chief complaint, 50 year old male patient. He's a carpenter. He has lost approximately 40 pounds since his last examination. Now, that could be a good thing or a bad thing. Typically, physiologic um, uh, loss of weight, normal physiologic loss of weight, even if you're working out all day and eating right, you shouldn't lose more than a pound and a half a week for a typical 70-kilogram um, male. The very fact that he lost 40 pounds in like a couple of weeks, that's something not good. So you look at the history. Patient says he has no dysphagia. <coughs> excuse me. No dysphagia or postprandial distress, and there's no report of diarrhea, nausea, or emesis, hematemesis, or constipation. Patient has a history of regional enteritis, appendicitis, and colonic bleeding. So right off the bat, I can start to make, uh, make a quiz. So I could take this, uh, uh, like this part. I could copy it, and again, I'll pretend to be you, the student. And then right in the header on the top part, I'll put student name, 
MED120. Um, and if it was uh, since it's week seven, uh, week seven discussion. And then I'll put the, the, the whole case or a piece of the case right here. And then I could have my questions. One, so right off the bat, 50 year old male patient has lost uh, approximately 40 pounds of size. Patient says he has no dysphagia or postprandial distress. So, which is the following? Uh, it goes, uh, which of the following describes pain? Um, after eating a meal? Is it A, preprandial, postprandial, periprandial, all of the above, or none of the above? And you could see what I did. I took this word, postprandial, and I did what? Made a question based on the case, right? So we want to know the um, uh, the doctor who uh, asked him stuff, right? They wanted to know is because after he ate, did he have any distress? Another uh, variant of that kind of question is choose the true statement. Patient had pain during eating. Patient had pain. Uh, uh, before eating. Patient had pain after eating. All of the above, none of the above. So the patient had no dysphagia, no prosprandial distress. So the patient did not have any pain before, during, or after eating according to this postprandial, right? So it's none of the above. So this is how your final is gonna look like. I won't ask you what does postprandial mean in context of just the word. It will be related to the case, right? Um, did the patient have any diarrhea? Nope, nausea. Emesis, which is vomiting. Hematemesis, which is vomiting blood or constipation. I could ask about the patient's past medical history. He had regional enteritis, meaning he had a localized inflammation or infection of his intestines. He also had appendicitis and he had a previous history of a colonic bleed. The regional enteritis, he had an ileostomy with appendectomy about six months ago. So I could ask, he goes in his uh, past medical history, what surgeries did he have? Because did he have a opening created in his uh, in small intestine? Yes, he did. Did he have his uh, appendix removed? Yes, he did. When did that happen? Six months ago. And those are the kind of questions you create. Five questions per case. And you know you could pick one case. And several of you picked like both cases and did two questions on one and three questions on the other. It doesn't matter what combo as long as there's five questions. And the questions that you created, the, um, is it pertaining to the case above? Now, this is also good exercise because, and this is how your NCLEX looks like. NCLEX always shows like some sort of case or some sort of clinical vignette. And a clinical vignette is like a little story, chief complaint, which is your CC, history of present illness, which is this is going on right here, that's called your HPI your PMH or past medical history, that's this stuff here, right? And that's what you, that's what you get asked in real life. And, and the NCLEX is very clinically oriented. And that's why I switch uh, years ago, a couple of years ago, actually, I switched up gears in the second half of medical terminology to make it look and act and feel more like an NCLEX type, um, um, type setup. So this is what you're practicing. And this is what, you, um, what your task for next week. And I'll put it in into discussion seven. Don't worry about discussion six. Because um, uh, if you put it in discussion six, 
I'll get, I'll give you credit. If you put it in discussion five, I'll give you credit. That's not the point. The point is, right? This is how you're supposed to do it. Okay. Does anyone ever have any questions on how, how this is going to be? Five yes. questions, multiple. Question. Two. Go ahead. Oh, okay. First of all, I didn't know uh, we are supposed to write five questions. I wrote three. And the case that I took, um, there was no assessment plan. There was no assessment in it. So I had to create the assessment myself. I well, thought, it does, it does, like you see here, I didn't even go through the assessment yet. This is only your subjective and your objective. I didn't even go through no. assessment or plan. And the, 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 the point is, are there medical terms in there that require translation. So it, you don't have to have a subjective, objective assessment and plan, like, uh, let's go back, like this whole thing. Oh, okay. right? Like you don't have to, like, you know, you can ask all the questions just regarding the history. You can add all, ask all the questions just regarding the assessment, right? Um, and of course, impression, okay. that's your diagnosis. And the plan is, what are we gonna do? I could ask you, what are we going to do for our patient is Mr. Knowles? What are we going to do for Mr. Knowles? Will we uh, view his large intestine? Will we remove his large intestine? Will we give medications for his large intestine? And as you could see here, patient has been advised to do what? Colonoscopy. We're going to view a process of viewing. He'll have a lower GI um, series for his colon or his lower intestine. And if his, and what I could ask the question, what if his symptoms persist? Where is he supposed to go? He's supposed to go to the ED or ER, and that's your emergency department, right? So it doesn't always, you don't have to do like every little thing. You could just focus on this part, but you know, it's nice to pick all the parts. So if it doesn't have an assessment or, or a part, you know, this is also another clue on how, on what words look good to test because they even give you right here, what are the highlighted ones, highlighted words here? And if you noticed, they look kind of like the ones I just asked. I could also ask, does your patient have any, does your patient have any cancer? So you have to look at it. He had, uh, I goes, uh, we looked at his sigmoidoscopy. Did we do his large intestine, small intestine, both or neither? The sigmoid is part of your large intestine. So we looked at large intestine. Did he have any bleeding? in the anal rectal area? No, he did not. And that's actually the kind of questions you get asked on a day-to-day -day basis when you do the job for real. I don't ask you, what's the suffix? What's the prefix? What does this word mean? What does that word mean? I ask you for data. And I ask you, do you know what, do you know the history and the assessment and what went down and what's the plan of our patient, right? Typically, I'll have anywhere from 80 to 100 patients so I have to ask the nursing staff, hey, do you know what's going on with my patient, Herman Knowles? And then you should be able to give uh, an assessment just like this, a brief synopsis of what's going down. If you look, there's another one. You look at uh, another patient, Mr. Aaron Chin, right? What was his thing? Well, he was admitted with esophageal CA, so he has cancer. So if he has cancer, who else do I call? If someone has uh, uh, got cancer, let's, let's have this, um, Aaron Chin, right? Of this question, Here's another example. Regarding the patient, Aaron Chin. And then I'll give the whole thing. And let's say you have the diagnosis of esophageal carcinoma. What's the diagnosis of my patient? Is it A, he has cancer of the throat, cancer of the mouth, uh, cancer of the uh, windpipe, cancer of the vocal cords. What's a better word for? Yeah, yeah, well, this is good enough. So the best answer is what? Of course, this one. It's the closest one. Right? Because my patient has esophageal, al pertaining to your esophagus, 
which is your food tube, which is in your throat. It's not your mouth, it's not your windpipe, it's not your vocal cords, this is, this is the closest thing, right? And we definitely know he has cancer because what? The diagnosis says what? CA, and what is this DX diagnosis? That's the state or condition of complete or thorough knowledge. That means it's definitive. I could also ask what doctor Could it be an oncologist, neurologist, nephrologist, both B and C? So who uh, who's going to manage Mr. Chin's tumor? Who's the experts at cancer out of these things? The oncologist. The oncologist, correct. They're the ones who are going to deal with it. But if he has to have surgery, then we call surgery, right? But there are also some oncologists that are also surgeons as well. If he had a problem with his brain and a brain tumor, it'd be a neurologist. If he had a problem with his kidney, uh, it would be who? Nephrologist, okay? So there were like, um, in the real world, it was more like, who's seeing Dr. Chin? If you're not quite sure, but you see the diagnosis is esophageal CA, you could say to the other doctor, um, I don't see any doctor on record, but Mr. Chin looks like he has esophageal CA. Uh, let me call oncology to see who picked him up. Or I look at the report, right? Your operative report, who did it? Catherine Oswald. So we call Catherine Oswald. Maybe they did it. And that's your job all day, every day, getting the data to the people who need it the most. And nine times out of 10, he's usually the physician. Uh, because my job is to do diagnosis and the plan, right? And uh, it's everyone else's job to do the other stuff. But a good physician worth their salt should be able to do everything because we're trained to. We could ask, how do we confirm the malignancy, right? What surgery was performed? That's a nice question. Where exactly was the carcinoma located? Uh, goes, uh, what was adjacent lymph nodes? Let's look at the lymph nodes. Do you have lymph nodes, infiltrating the tumor? Uh, we anastomosis, that means we reconnected. That's what an anastomosis is. It's a reconnection of the stomach. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. And the lymph node was what? Removed. Now, when we remove lymph nodes is because there is a potential for the um, cancer to be in the localized lymph, no lymph nodes. And that's when we, um, we remove them just to be sure, okay? No complications during the procedure. That means it went by the numbers. Patient left the operating room in stable condition. And then now the Department of Internal Medicine will and oncology will take over his recovery to make sure he's okay. Because remember, Catherine Oswald, she's the surgeon. They only care about what? What happens in that OR? Everything before and after. That's everyone else's. That's everyone else's problem. And you can see how it's called compartmentalized uh, the hospital. So does everyone understand on how how this is going to go down for future reference and how your final will look like? Now um, another public service announcement is that going forward, there um, all classes will be on campus for this term. Meaning to say is. Uh, next Monday, the Monday after that, and the Monday after that, week eight, week nine, week 10 is all on campus. If you cannot make any of those days, please give me a call so I can have options for you um, to uh, log in, right? Uh, but if all of us are going to show, which would be optimal, uh, that would be great. But you have to inform me if you can't show and do know and understand there are other professors that will not give you this option. It is all intents and purposes mandatory for you to um, um, to come to class, okay? Uh, but I do, uh, me personally, I understand there's still a pandemic going on. Uh, people still have high risk, family members and such and such. It's up to you, but you need to inform your professor when you're gonna be out. Uh, we used to even have that even in pre-COVID. So please shoot me an email, uh, remind me if you're not gonna be there 
um, and even not going to be there for online. So if no one's going to be there online, I don't have to turn on my computer and I, I can just show up to class. Classes will be held in Health Lab 1, fourth floor, Alexandria campus, 6 p.m. Mondays. And I'll have that all uh, later on this evening with the dates in your um, course announcements as per, you know, as per our, our protocol. All righty. And da, 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 what else we have to do? So what's this week, week seven? That's musculoskeletal. Now, musculoskeletal um, relies heavily on medical terminology. And let me show you how. So if I go to table of contents and I go to musculoskeletal, which is chapter 10, Man, my computer's slow today. Musculoskeletal, who are the people in our neighborhood? Orthopedics and rheumatology. Orthopedics, ortho means straight, peds mean uh, foot. Um, these people not only deal with straightening out your foot, but straightening out any of your musculoskeletal problems. So any problem with the muscle, any problem with your skeleton, like a broken bone, pulled muscles, messed up tendons, all sorts of injuries, Department of Orthopedics do it. Now, the Department of Orthopedics is a surgical service. So when you're sent to see them, they're going to manage you surgically. That means they got to cut into you, okay? Um, and they have some medical stuff, but um, by the time you get to see the orthopedist, um, that's some serious, uh, it, it has to be corrected surgically. Now, another subsection of orthopedic medicine, sub subsection is sports medicine. Now, sports medicine, um, uh, they're a little subspecialty because people who are in sports are not the healthiest people in the world. Let me qualify in, in that statement. They look great, don't they? But they are machines. They are machines to perform a sport. And that's why so many of them have so many joint and muscle problems when they get older. That's the stuff no one shows you. Um, I, I love uh, football, the NFL, and I got to meet one of my uh, all-time uh, all heroes. And when I met him, he was, uh, he was a much, much older man and very, very broken. But when I was seeing him as a kid, I, I looked at him as this powerful, powerful man with all these muscles and, and he's huge. He's like 6'5", a good 280. But when you look at him now, he barely could stand up to shake my hand. And he apologized for his weak handshake because he had multi multiple arthritides. Now, who deals with the arthritis or the arthritides, plural? Arthritis is the job of a uh, subspecialty of uh, internal medicine, which is rheumatology. Rheumat means, um, uh, talks about the fluid in between your joints. Your synovial joints are the joints that uh, move most freely in your body, uh, fluid in it. And when that fluid goes awry or the joints start to break up and when you get older, you get a lot of arthritis, right? Inflammation or infection of that joint space for whatever reason, Department of Rheumatology will help deal with it. And they are medical. They, they deal with your joint problems, typically medically. But if it gets really bad, we can send you to orthopedics to have surgery. For example, my knees, they're awful. I have a lot of problems with them, but I've been managing them medically for the last 10 years. Well, my rheumatologist says eventually, if it gets worse, I'm going to have to go to the orthopedist and they're going to have to start shaving stuff and putting pins and God knows what. And all of these people, orthopedics, uh, sports medicine, rheumatology, they all are MDs and they all deal with muscles and your skeleton, hence the musculoskeletal disorders. Now, chiropractic medicine, I got a good friend, his name is John. Uh, both of us met um, in a boxing tournament. They call him Dr. John and they just call me, me, right? Um, he's a doctor as a doctorate of chiropractic medicine. Um, they are not medical physicians. But they are, um, they do help people. And chiropractor, chiropractic medicine 
is is viable. It's a real science. And the way they help you is through um, um, like stretching exercises and different um, movements and uh, um, on different modalities like like heat and cold. Um, they also work very well with sports medicine. And that's how I got to meet John. He's also a boxing trainer. Uh, around the time I was uh, teaching my eldest boy how to fight, uh, I brought him to, um, to a boxing camp and I met Dr. John years ago. And um, uh, he, uh, he gave me a couple of sessions for free since we're such good friends. And I can tell you, it's more than a massage when you get your, like get, they crack your back and do these weird, weird things. It's considered alternative medicine. Uh, typical MDs and nurses, they're considered traditional Western medicine, but uh, there's a lot of data for chiropractic medicine and there's a place for it in the, in the healthcare world. And they do quite well for themselves because not everything requires meds, not everything in this world requires surgery. Um, stretching, breathing, a whole bunch of things. <clears throat> When I was in much better shape, uh, Dr. John got me on his wonderful stretching regimen. If any of you in the morning stretch, that is one of the greatest things you can do for your cardiovascular. Uh, if you guys do any like Pilates or uh, yoga or hot yoga, it has a lot of stretching in it and um, it does wonders. I really should get back on my regimen because I'm a, I'm a train wreck uh, medically right now. I'm just a mess. Now, let's look at these examples of medical terminology that could help you in your anatomy and physiology class. So let's look at typical shapes. Here's a shape right here. That's a triangle. Another word for triangle is the Greek letter for del delta. Because delta is the Greek letter triangle, you know, if you're into fraternities and sororities. This is a deltoid. It, oid means similar to or looks like, looks like a delta. Got to use your imagination a little bit. Your trapezius, if you look here, it looks like a squashed rectangle, also known as a trapezoid. You have your um, rhomboidus muscle as well. It looks like a, um, uh, another kind of squashed uh, uh, rectangle. And that's also in your back. And those are all shapes. You could also look at location. Brachio means upper arm. So your brachioradialis means it's the muscles of your upper arm connecting into your radial bone, which is your thumb side bone. So you can see from the upper arm to your thumb side radial bone right there. Your triceps brachii, your biceps brachii. Brachii also means, as you can see here, upper arm. Your brachioradialis connects to your upper arm. Triceps brachii is part of your upper arm in the posterior section of your upper arm. And there's tri, three of them. You don't see the, you can see the lateral head and a little bit of the medial head, but there's one little one underneath it. Hence the term tri. You also have your quadriceps. They're down here. Your quadriceps, quad means four. So there's four sets of muscles. You have your biceps brachii here. That means two sets of muscles. Um, another shape is your orbicularis. So you have your uh, orbicularis oris and your orbicularis oculi. Orb means round. Oculi means eyes. Oris means mouth. So your orbicularis muscles have to be the ones around your eyes, the ones around your mouth. Sternocleidomastoid connects from your sternum. Clido means your clavicle and your mastoid process here of your skull. You can see it connects here, here, and here. Hence the name sternocleidomastoid. You have some muscles like your pectoralis muscle that are big. Hence the term pectoralis major. Another big muscle is your gluteus maximus, right? It's the maximum, the big one, right? Other medical terms talk about direction. So you have your abdominal obliques that are here, right? And then you have your rectus abdominis here. Rectus means straight, oblique means diagonal. So this has to be the abdominal oblique. This has to be the rectus abdominis. 
Uh, gastrocnemius. Gastro means um, stomach or belly. So it looks like a big belly. You know, your calf muscle right here. So with that being said, if you know your medical terminology, the chapters in your anatomy and physiology uh, won't be as bad and you won't have a memorizing problem as you would if you were just doing it right from scratch. Now, we all know that if you look at here, all the muscle starts combining into this band of connective tissue. That band of connective tissue is called your fascia. And sometimes, like let's say I damage this. If I damage this muscle here, guess what? There's gonna be damage here. So I'm going to have to repair the covering and the fibrous membrane supporting the muscles called your fascia, hence the term uh, fascioplasty or fascioplasty, plasty surgical repair. A common uh, tumor that we can find in muscles is a fibroma because it's made out of fibrous tissue. And remember, before the biopsy, I don't know if it's cancer or not. So OMA, there you go. OMA means a, a tumor, it just means a lump or bump. Lyoma, uh, lyomyoma, you have smooth muscle and you have striated muscle. Smooth muscle or visceral muscle, you can't, um, can't really control. You can't really control your stomach and your intestines and all that. And all of that's lined with muscle, but you can have a tumor in there and that's called your lyomyoma. Lumbocostal, lumbar, means your loins or your lower back. You know, where do you, where do you wrap a loincloth? You wrap it around your waist or your lower back. And costal is your ribs. So if you're having lumbocostal pain, it's your pain of your ribs and your lower back. Muscular, of course, that's easy. Myorexis, rupture of the muscle. Sometimes if you overwork this, it'll rip, it'll tear, right? And that's called myorexis. Then I have to perform a fascioplasty and a myoplasty to repair this. And the Department of Orthopedics will be the guys and gals to do it for you. Tendons. Tendons are um, uh, like fascia uh, and they're actually part and parcel of your fascia. Tendons are um, connective tissue that connect uh, muscle to bone. So if the tendon breaks, so it's gonna affect your muscle, so it's gonna affect the, the, um, the affected bone area. So sometimes we gotta do a tenotomy, we gotta cut it so we can sew it all together and perform a tendoplasty. So sometimes you gotta break something to go fix it. And they do a lot of that kind of philosophy in the Department of Orthopedics. Tendinitis, of course, inflammation or infection of your tendon. And you guys know if you've ever had this, can't walk very well, can't move very well in that affected area. Myalgia, muscle pain. Asthenia, weakness or disability. So a weakness of your muscle, that's myasthenia. Um, there's a disease called myasthenia gravis where there's a progressive weakness during the course of a single day of your muscles. In the morning, you won't be able to move your arms. By noon, you won't be able to breathe because you remember that you need your muscles to breathe, to move your uh, rib cage so that, and your um, diaphragm muscle so that you can breathe. Myopathy, any disease process of your, um, of your muscles. Now, paralysis. Paralysis is a funny word. Let's look at... Um, Look at some pictures. Now, if you look at the word paralysis, we know it means, para means alongside, and lysis means the breakdown. If you look at this, your spinal cord is inside here. And then what exits out of your spinal cord are these spinal nerves. So what happens if you break your bone and it cuts into the spinal cord and then cuts into the spinal nerves? Well, things like this happen. 
paraplegia, which uh, you are um, uh, paralyzed or can't move or feel anything from the waist down. Quadriplegia, it's from your neck on down. Um, hemiplegia, like if you have a stroke, is half of your body. For example, if I had a stroke, a severe stroke, especially in my cerebral cortex on the left side of my brain, I won't be able to move, to move the majority of the right side of my body and vice versa. So that's what paralysis is. The, either the spinal cord or the spinal nerves para alongside here get laced or broken down. And hence, you won't be able to either feel or move or both or neither uh, with that injury. So hemiplegia is paralysis on one side of your body. Uh, paraplegia is from your neck on down and para meaning four, right? Or quadriplegia, quadri meaning four means um, uh, all four of your limbs, essentially from your neck on down. Myorophy, suturing, a process of suturing of your muscles because if I'm gonna do a tendoplasty and all that, odds are I'm gonna to have to suture up a torn muscle as well. And myosarcoma, sarcoma, different from oma, is definitely a malignant tumor. That means it's bad news. It means it grows very fast, it's very aggressive, and it likes to travel. That's what a malignant tumor does. So if you have a myosarcoma, that's something that your oncologist is gonna to have to deal with much more severely or much more aggressively than your benign tumors. Uh, let's look at some words. Oh, movements. You'll also need this again when you're in med surge, when you're in uh, anatomy and physiology, you gotta know your motions and they come in pairs. So you have flexion and, insta and extension. Flexion, is when you bring your arm here to flex your bicep muscle here. And when that happens, you're actually decreasing the angle here. So with your arm all the way out, that's uh, 180 degrees. Then up here, 90. And then here, less than 90. Therefore, the angle of this joint space right here is decreasing. And extension is the exact opposite. It means increases of the angle of the joint. This pair here is abduction and adduction. So easy to screw this up. Now, how do you remember it? Adduction and abduction talk about with in reference of movement towards or away midline. This is how I remember it. When you abduct somebody, you're taking them away from you. So abduction is either movement of your arm or your leg away from midline. And adduction is the exact opposite, or adding your arm or your leg to midline. Pick one, memorize like your life depended on it, and the other one is simply the other one. Rotation or circumduction, that's easy. Circum means going around. Pronation and supination, this gets tricky. That's why I just do pronation, palms down. That's how I remember it. Uh, other people said, no, it's Superman. Supernation, palms up. Whichever way you want to figure it out, figure it out. Prone means palms down. Supernation, palms up. And we do a pronation supernation test, and it looks like patty cake. Uh, we do that in neurologic exam to uh, see if you have any motion uh, deficiencies and coordination deficiencies. And you will if you have significant brain damage. Those of you who love wearing four inch heels know about eversion and inversion, okay? Eversion is when uh, the sole of your foot moves outward. Uh, over the weekend, I got a really bad ankle sprain from an eversion. Um, I bumped into one of the kids' toys and it pointed my whole ankle out that way. And of course the ankle gets swollen and then I get local arthritis and it's painful. A little bit of tendonitis as well, because there's tendons in there as well. But eversion means moving outside. And inversion is when you sprain your ankle and you move it inside, okay? 
And when you have a patient said, oh, I sprained my ankle, you have to ask them, which way did you hurt it? This way going outwards or this way going inwards? Dorsiflexion versus plantar flexion. Okay, this is how I remember it. This is good for the Babinski plantar reflex when you learn it in neurologic. You know that test where we tickle your feet, we take a pen or a pen light or the tip of the reflex hammer and I rub it underneath your feet. If anyone ever experienced that in the emergency room, especially after a bad uh, auto accident, I am checking to see uh, if my patient's foot properly dorsiflex. Dorsiflexion, when you elevate your foot. Plantar flexion, when you point, point your toes. And this is how I always remember it. Where do I point my toes? I plant my toes into the ground. That's how I remember it. You figure out your way. But plantar, plant my toes into the ground, plantar flexion. Dorsiflexion is just the exact opposite. Oh, looky here. Um, nice to know, but uh, you know, you're know you gonna need to know this for anatomy and physiology anyway. This is called your articular skeleton, the, um, the one in blue and the one in like beige is your app. I mean, sorry. The one in blue is your appendicular. The one in beige is your axial skeletal system. Your appendages or your appendicular skeletal system includes your shoulder girdle, which is here, which is your scapula, clavicle, and humerus. Okay, and uh, your pelvic girdle here is uh, part of your ilium, ischium, and uh, your sacrum, coccyx, and anything that's a gurgle, girdle is something that surrounds an area here. You have your femur, tibia, fibula, and patella, which is kneecap. Now you'll also notice that your wrists and your feet look similar. You have your carpals, metacarpals, and phalanges. Tarsals, metatarsals, and phalanges. How do you tell toes from your fingers? Well, your phalanges lower extremity would be your toes. Your phalanges upper extremity will be your fingers. We label the fingers one, two, three, four, five with number one digit, meaning your thumb, number five digit, meaning your pinky. And it's the same thing for your feet. Your number one digit on your feet would be your big toe, and uh, your number five digit would be pinky toe. So one, two, three, four, five, okay? And you have carpals, metacarpals, and phalanges, tarsals, metatarsals, and phalanges. So tarsals, think ankle. Carpals, like in carpal tunnel, think wrist. Carpotosis, nice segue. Those are your wrist bones. If you have ptosis or prolapse, uh, also known as a drop wrist, it's because you have some nerve damage and some potential carpal tunnel syndrome. And you guys heard of carpal tunnel syndrome. That's when, you know, you use your fingers a lot, you're in a job or you, you're the kind of person who uses your hands a lot. And then it causes some nerve damage because the tendon that forms this tunnel where your wrist is, after prolonged use tends to collapse. Like for example, my sister has been in IT, so she does coding. She did coding for years. So her whole entire day was typing. Her job in high school, even before college, was typing. And she was typing notes all the time. So is it any surprise that she's had surgery in both her wrists already? And that's how she knew something was up. She saw some carpotosis. She's like, why is my wrist not as strong and it's drooping a little bit? That's not good. Cervical means pertaining to your cervix or your neck, or it could mean the cervical region of your uterus. Depends on the context. So if we're talking about obstetrics, cervical means pertaining to the cervix of your uterus. But if we're talking about in context of uh, orthopedic medicine, I mean, orthopedic surgery, cervical most likely means your neck. Costal ribs, so your intercostal space are the spaces in between your ribs. Your subcostal space is the space underneath your ribs, which has a lot of arteries, veins, and nerves. So if you wanna uh, poke somebody in the ribs, right? Poke them underneath one of the ribs and kind of hurts. That's why when you're measuring up on your EKG for your chest, you know, don't poke so hard down there. 
have a little uh, bedside manner. Craniotomy, tomy, to cut into the skull. Now, it's, we don't really cut into the skull. We kind of use a drill. But the function of a craniotomy is usually to relieve pressure if there's bleeding or, uh, you know, um, excessive uh, fluid in your brain. Humerus or your funny bone, which is your upper arm. And you learn two words for that. Your brachium, which is also your upper arm. Now your humerus is the bone of your upper arm. We talked about metacarpals, metatarsals, right? We talked about carpals and tarsals are your um, ankle, phalanges, upper extremity versus lower extremity. You could have phalangitis, inflammation or infection of your toes or your fingers. If it's upper extremity, of course, fingers, lower extremity, toes. Spondylitis, inflammation or infection of your vertebra and or, uh, goes, or your back, um, also known as your backbone. And that's not a good thing because if I have spondylitis, guess who's going to get the itis next? What's inside your backbone, which is your spinal cord. And that's danger, danger. You also have these things called your intervertebral disc. Let's look at... Uh, Into, see, this is your vertebra. In between your vertebra, there's a little piece of uh, cartilage. Acts like a shock absorber for a lot of the stress and strains. And that's your IV disc or interventricular disc. It's in between two, the body of two vertebrae. And what's inside this hole right here, right? This is all solid. Your spinal cord goes in here and your spinal nerves come out these. And these things are called facets here and uh, our pedicles and your nerves come out here. So you could see if you have a slip disc or a nucleus propulsus, which is this, the inner part, uh, a nucleus propulsus herniation. Herniation means what? Sticking out where it shouldn't stick out. All of this could stick out here. Why am I just showing? Let's look at the... Uh, an actual herniation. Ooh, look at here. Herniated disc or slip disc. This is your spinal cord and this is your uh, your um, spinal nerve. You can see what happens. It comes out, it slips out, and then it'll pinch on this. And you could have pain, you could have uh, paralysis, uh, you won't be able to feel uh, from that region on down. There's a whole bunch of things depending on what part of the nerve did it mess with. Your sternum, of course, is your breastbone. Calcaneus, um, that is your heel bone. Calcadinia, very common, especially with people who are on their feet and are runners. Pain in your heel bone. Um, don't ignore that. I had a runner friend of mine. She ran a marathon with a fracture of her heel, and then she was out with a cane for like a year because she didn't. She ignored simple calcaneal calcaneodynia, any part of your bones or any part of your body that hurts, go see somebody. Even if you're in the, especially in your, you're in the best shape, you got to go see somebody because it could be nothing or it could mean what? Everything. And she just dealt with the pain and she just thought, oh, you know, it's just training. You just got to, no pain, no gain. Don't do that. Don't be that person. Femoral. Your femur is your thigh bone. It's the longest, heaviest bone in your body. And your femoral uh, um, artery is right next to that. If you cut that, you got minutes to live. Um, there was a story about 10 years back. Um, um, I forgot if it was an army dude or marine dude. I just remember he was Filipino. That's all I remember. He got into a fight with a bouncer, but unfortunately for the bouncer, um, Guy had some training and cut him, uh, cut his femoral artery. Bouncer died in minutes. It's a very large artery. That, that means if you break your femur and cut that femoral artery, you got to control that bleed. And that's a bad news. But it takes a lot to break a femur. Like you need like a truck or something. Something big has to hit you. 
tibula and fibula, that's a bone in your lower leg. And uh, they go together. That's why sometimes they call them tib fib. Patella is your kneecap. Your pelvis, of course, is your hips. And pelvimetry, this is usually performed in uh, obstetrics to make sure that the measurements of the, uh, the hip region is good enough for baby. We could do it ultrasound, or you could do it the old fashioned way, digital, which is your, um, the, the doctor's finger. And you'll learn all about that in obstetrics. And if you're, if you're good at um, digital pelvimetry, you'll be just as good as the ultrasound. Um, my mother was in obstetrics for 10 years. She's just as accurate, accurate as any, as any uh, uh, ultrasound. Um, when I ran an ultrasound school, um, I, we had a, um, a, one of those uh, smart pelvic um, uh, simulator dummies that you could change the size of it so that do different kinds of pelvises, different kinds of things. And uh, my mother went to the lab. She was picking me up for dinner and uh, she was within half a centimeter off of the ultrasound, which goes to show you the real cost and the real um, importance of uh, healthcare is not the machines. It's the person behind it. And that's you. Radiograph, that's an X-ray. Okay, graph, instrument of recording, radio, thinks x-rays, radiation, x-rays. Ankylosis is abnormal condition, osis, of being bent or being stiff. Okay, and we mentioned uh, spondylitis a second ago, did we? There's something called ankylos ankylosing spondylitis, which is um, the bending of your vertebrae or your backbone and it causes significant amount of inflammation. So you get really stiff and you're all crooked and it's hard to walk around. Arthritis, of course, we already know, inflammation or infection of your um, joint and the Department of Rheumatology are experts at that. Costochondritis, inflammation or infection of your cartilage in your ribs, costochondritis. Your lamina, it's part of your vertebral arch. And uh, remember, I just showed it to you. Let's look at it again. Little quick. Uh... Remember I was talking about how spinal nerves go through here? Well, this area right here is called your lamina. Sometimes uh, that lamina, uh, like you get like, like a deformity or it starts impinging on um, your spinal nerve. So, oh, here's a better picture. So sometimes we got to cut this and that's called the laminectomy. And that this is your um, vertebral bone. So you use your imagination here is your spinal cord. And then what comes out is your spinal nerve. And if the spinal nerve gets impinged by this, we, we remove that bone and that's called a laminectomy. Myelocele, uh, that's herniation of your spinal cord. That's never a good thing. That's very dangerous because that's your spinal cord. That's the main cable that goes from your brain to the rest of your body and back again. Orthopedics, we already know about them. Osteitis, inflammation or infection of your bone. Remember, your bone is a living, breathing thing, and it can get infected just as easy as anything else. Osteoclast is a specific type of bone cell which destroys bone. Now, you may be wondering, wait a minute, why would I want to destroy bone? Well, the, just a quick uh, primer on your anatomy and physiology. Especially when you're young, your bone is going through a cycle, and it's called remodeling. And it goes through a cycle between osteoclast, osteocyte, and osteoblast. And osteoblast is an immature bone cell. Osteocyte is a mature bone cell. Now, the osteoclast, once the, you have a mature bone cell and it gets damaged or it gets old, the osteoclast breaks it down so it gets recycled parts into your osteoblast. And all of that cycle goes round and round and round. So it's like if there's damage, your bone, especially when you're young, 
your bone repairs itself and it's called remodeling. And that's why when you're young, you could, oh, what's a nasty fall I took? Well, like my son, he fell off the side of a cliff a couple of months ago. He's still alive, right? If I fell off the side of a cliff, I would be dead because I'm much older. This efficiency is less. And also when you get older, your cells tend to favor osteoclast or breakdown of bone. You also need osteoclast to break down bone so that you can um, release calcium, magnesium sulfates, and uh, other phosphates, right? And that's what makes bones hard. And also, um, let's say if um, a nursing mother needs, uh, needs more milk and needs more calcium, and we call upon the osteoclast to break down some of your bone so we can release some of those things. Arthrodesis or fixation. That's when we do those pins. And if you've ever seen a halo on somebody on either their leg or their, uh, let me show you. See that, if you've ever seen that, we actually drill holes in your head and it's to keep maintain your posture so that um, you don't move around too much. See? There's uh, several examples, and we could also, and that's some scary stuff. We use like, we use the stuff that you find in Home Depot, like drills and and a hole and screws, and it's. But of course, they're all sterilized, and it's just scary. I hate it. Uh, ephemeral. You also do it on your leg. See if your leg got all smashed up. Uh, we can do a halo on your leg. Ooh, look at this. Look at these all these pins woo, all around this poor, this poor patient. It's, the, it's actually on, on her whole body. You can see also pins here. Yikes. But that's, oh, here's the femoral one. Wow, this is probably a multiple, uh, multiple fracture and they have to mobilize the whole thing. And these things are connected to you via screws and pins. Oh, it's an adventure. Orthopedics is, is a lot like Home Depot. A lot of Home Depot stuff is going on. Um, I always tell the story about um, one of the first times I ever did orthopedic surgery in medical school. Like we had to chip away from bone to realign it. And I was being so, I don't know, weak. I was Because I was afraid. I'm, they gave me a sterilized hammer and chisel. So I'm chiseling away like millimeter by millimeter. But they wanted me to break it. And then when they showed me how to do it, it was just so frightening. Um, but nowadays, yeah, I could do it. But uh, man, that's a rough job. Um, arthrodesis, we already do well. And um, now you could also have um, arthroclasis. If I'm immobilizing the joint, I could also want to break it. And we use a, no lie, we use a hammer and a chisel to do it. We also use osteoclasis which we surgically fracture a bone. For example, um, my, my father-in-law, um, he, um, uh, he was in law enforcement and um, he was, I don't know why he was climbing up the side of a building. Maybe he thought he was Spider-Man, but then he, uh, he fell a little over a story and a half and then um, he fractured his hip. Now, like back in the sixties, you know, medicine was like, eh, kind of iffy. So they said it and then he could kind of semi walk again. So they gave him a desk job all those years. Years later, they found out they didn't do it right. So uh, about 10 years ago, they had to perform an osteoclasis. They had to fracture his hip bone and his femur so that they can rebuild it back up again so he can walk normally. Um, man, that was some hardcore stuff. Um, diaphysis is the, the shaft of your long bone. A typical long bone is your femur. Let's look at this. There's a long bone. And your diaphysis is this long part, the shaft. And the end parts are called your epiphysis, right? Epi means on top of. And you have epiphyseal cartilage on both ends. 
to um, minimize friction and wear and tear. But guess what happens when you get old? Am I depressing everybody when I keep on telling you, guess what happens when you get old? Well, good, because it is not fun. There's another thing that happens when you get old, osteoporosis, ladies. So if you don't pay attention to your calcium, especially if you had children, you will start having an abnormal, uh, abnormal condition where your bones become porous and they start leaking out uh, magnesium, calcium, all of the things that make your bones tough and strong. And then when you get much, much older, you could have a pathologic fracture. And a pathologic fracture is when you start breaking things um, uh, with little to no trauma. Like, like what I said, when I was a kid, I could fall. I could, I've, I've done so much damage to myself and, I, and I'm still alive to tell the story. But um, I told the story a couple of summers ago. I fell out of my car. No lie. I fell from the seat of my car onto the sidewalk. And I seriously came this close to uh, calling an ambulance because I felt tingling in my foot. I thought I broke something. I thought maybe I have a fracture of my neck. And I pretty much laid in the driveway for about 15 minutes while my neighbors and my mother and my daughter stared at me like, uh, because I didn't want anyone to call anybody yet until I knew for sure that, I, that something was wrong. And it's just that I fell and just couldn't recover like I used to. Oh, well, is what it is. Remember, if you take care of this machine called the human body, it should take care of you back. Unfortunately, I haven't been taking care of mine lately, and now it's striking severe revenge upon me. Here you go. Here's your diaphysis, the shaft, epiphysis, the ends. And you could see there's cartilage on the ends. And you could also see that bone is hollow and it has arteries, veins, and nerves. It has red marrow, yellow marrow, a whole bunch of things in it, right? It's a living, breathing thing. Therefore, it can also die. Therefore, it can also get cancer and it also can get sick. And we have to maintain it and keep it alive. Let us see osteomyelitis. That's easy. Here you go. Osteomyelitis. Infection of the bone and myel, myelo, which is also bone marrow. Okay. So it's not only the bone, but the marrow inside got infected. It's not very nice. It's kind of painful. And osteomyelitis could be, could be managed either surgically or if it's really bad. Um, uh, I mean, if it's not so bad, it can be managed medically. If it's really bad, it's gotta be managed surgically with the Department of Orthopedics. Let's look at this. This caught my eye. Arthrocentesis. That's when we stick this huge needle in your joint space in order to get some fluid. What fluid? The synovial fluid that helps you, um, that um, lubricates your joints so that you can fully have full ROM or range of motion. And here we go. Here's arthro arthroscopy. And they could also perform uh, arthrocentesis. They could, um, the trimming instrument, instead of the trimming instrument, you pull that out and then you just put a big needle in there and it'll, um, you aspirate um, any fluid that you need here. Now, this is great stuff, even though it looks brutal, because it's better than what? Back in the 80s, before there was a really good arthroscopy, 80s and 70s, we'd have to open you up. And that has, ooh, that has a um, recovery time of months. Nowadays, this arthroscopy, um, last time I had arthrocentesis, recovery time was what, a couple of days? Um, so, and they got all the data and they knew exactly. They also got pictures on how bad my knee is. And that's why they know what kind of prognosis I have. If I, you know, if I still stay active and drop my weight, maybe we can avoid surgery another 10 years. But they're now telling me, I got to go do it. And I don't want to because you guys know how I feel about surgeons, but that's my bias. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. Here you go. This is another uh, um, 
thing that we can do in real life. And this patient, after therapy, they can actually walk and move around. I have, uh, I had a running buddy of mine. She had pins here, 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 and here. And she still runs marathons. She's, uh, where, how old is she now? 69, 70? And she has better run time. Well, I can't even, I can't even run more than three miles anymore. And she has better run times. And a marathon is, what is a marathon? Like 24 miles? Some ridiculous number like that. Even in my best shape, I ran only half marathons. And I only did that three times. And you can ask Dr. Hamida from uh, Falls Church. Uh, 10 years ago was my last one. And it's around the time I met Dr. Hamida. I was on crutches for two weeks after that race. Here's some fractures. You got transverse, goes right across. And this is a closed fracture because it stayed inside. You have an open fracture here, and it's also uh, oblique because it's diagonally. Um, this fraction right here is only a partial where it gets bent on one side, uh, or is this one it? I forgot which one's it. Well, when it's bent on one side and fractured only like incompletely, that's called a, a green stick fracture. When it, um, when it all fragments out, like when gunshot wounds, it's called uh, comminuted. Let's see what other, let's see the answers. Comminuted, impacted, eh, complex. Oh, seven, it's colus. You fracture your wrist, your, your hand is gonna start looking like a dinner fork. That's why when you get a colus fracture or a Coles fracture, potato, potato, whatever you wanna call it, which is a fracture of your wrist, you get what they call um, a dinner fork deformity of your phalanges. Let's see, what else? What else looks good? Oh, here's your spinal cord. I mean, spinal cord, here's your vertebrae, your spinal cord's inside it. You have your cervical one, which is in your neck, your thoracic ones, which is your chest, your lumbar ones, which is your loin or your waist, and your fused sacral, which is down here. And at the very end, you have your coccyx or your tailbone. Cervical, thoracic, lumbar, sacral, coccygeal. Oh, forgot the numbering. Since there's seven vertebrae up here, it's numbered C1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Thoracic, there are 12. So we label them T1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Lumbar, there are five. So it's lumbar one, two, three, four, five. Now sacral is fused, right? But there are sacral nerves, uh, one, two, three, and four. Um, and you have your coccygeal, which is very, uh, which is there's only one, and that's on the end. Uh, oh, I told you, I showed you the numbering system. Um, regarding radiographs or x-rays, AP means anterior posterior. It means the picture is coming from the front to the back and then to the plate. PA is posterior anterior, which means that the, the x-ray is going from your back to your front and then onto the plate. Okay. So there are two different views. You can also have a side view, which is called a lat. You could have a diagonal view. It's called an oblique. Um, DO or doctor, uh, doctorate of osteopathy. Osteo means bone, pathy means disease. Nowadays, the modern DO, they have the same responsibilities and same training as an MD, except for surgery. But nowadays, that's just they just have to take an extra surgical service, um, usually in their externship, and they'll have the same. Um, you probably you probably had a DO in your life and probably and never knew it, because they all do the same things as the MDs. Same things with your um, uh, um, DNP. You may have seen somebody who you thought was the doctor, but it was a uh, but it was a very very advanced nurse, and they do the. They do a lot of the same things. RA is rheumatoid arthritis, oid resembling the fluid. And that's what, uh, that's the problem. 
because RA, the fluid in your joint spaces um, has, uh, you start to have like a um, autoimmune uh, reaction to it. Like your body starts attacking that fluid um, and then you get arthritis, inflammation or infection of the joint space. RA is not fun. I, I have RA and gouty arthritis. When you, when you are immunocompromised, this thing fires up and it is not fun. I mentioned myasthenia gravis earlier. Eh, nice to know. Um, we don't call it MG. Everyone just says myasthenia gravis. Um, total hip replacement or THR, that's semi-common. Fracture is a capital F with an X followed by you know location and type. Um, the rest of these are diseases and conditions. I'm not going to go over them. Uh, you're going to see them in other classes. And um, let's jump right into – oh, you'll learn this too. Scoliosis, kyphosis is called um, – uh, I forgot which one's kyphosis, which one's lordosis. Um, Kyphosis is hunchback, lordosis is swayback, okay? Now, if you look at the normal curvature of the spine, you can see these are abnormal curvatures of the spine. Scoliosis, kyphosis, and lordosis. Arthroplasty, surgical reconstruction or a repair of your joint space. Okay, sequestrectomy. Uh, Sequestrum or necrose bone. So bone. There are parts of bone that can get damaged and they can die. We have to remove that because it causes these, this stuff called um, bone fragment and called bone dust. And your body will not see that as your own cells. It'll see it as foreign and then you'll start attacking it and, it, and just really bad news. This is nice to know, gold salts and bone resorption inhibitors, but this is must know, NSAID, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug. The most common is uh, Tylenol and uh, Motrin, right? And they, they're good for RA, osteoarthritis, you know, all the itises. Um, but I can tell you right now, if you're a flare-up, uh, NSAIDs won't cut it. Um, Sometimes we have to use narcotics and it gets really, really bad. I'm only in my early 50s and I never thought in a million years I'd, I would need something that strong uh, to help me uh, alleviate pain. Now, let's look at these cases. So give you an idea what could be asked on an exam or how you could do this week's um, discussion. So I have a radiologic report. Um, my patient's name is Arthur Rexon. So I could ask this question. What kind of doctor is uh, Dr. Meyerson? If Dr. Meyerson did the radio radiologic report and did the radiologic read or wet read um, of my patient here, Dr. Rexon, what department is he in? Um, is he a radiologist? Yeah, it's radiology. Thank you. Good. Right, so that could be a question, because how many times, like, who saw him, Myerson? Which Myerson? Radio, and then I call Doctor Myerson and radiology, right? So we look at this. I could ask. He says anterior, posterior, and lateral views of the lumbar spine and AP view of the sacrum. Okay, I could ask. What did Myerson order? Right. Let's say uh, I'm uh, Doctor. I'm, I'm Mr. Rexon's uh, primary care physician. And then I'm in the same hospital. We're all, we're all in, let's say, I know it together, right? And you're the nurse on the ward. And I go, hey, did anyone see my patient? Did we, did we run any tests today? And, go, and you'll tell me, yeah. Myerson brought him down the radio. What for? And you'll tell me, um, two views, lumbar spine, AP lat, and one view for sacrum, uh, AP. And I go, do we have a wet read? And you'll tell me, yeah. It looks like uh, she has displacement of his lumbar, fifth lumbar and first sacral, L5, S1. So your L5, lumbar five is now doing what? It's drooping down to S1, that's not good. 
you'll now tell me that the L5S1 intervertebral disc has some shadowing and decreased density. That means it's starting to break apart. Slight narrowing of the L3, L4, and L4, L5. That means that the IV disc is starting to shrink. That's not good. There were bilateral laminectomies done, meaning what? We removed a lamina or a piece of the vertebrae on not one side, but both sides. Where did we do it? Lumbar five, sacral one. Hypertrophic lipping. Hyper means too much. Trophic means growth. So there's too much growth on the lip of the upper, it goes upper part of the spine. And it shows upon flexion and extension when they ask the patient to bend over or to bend backwards, right? And there's slight motion on all lumbar and lumbosacral levels. And then I could ask, what was the, it goes, well, what was Myerson's diagnosis? What does he want me to do? And then you'll say, well, it looks like there's degenerative IV disc, L5S1, narrowing of L3, L4, L4, and L5. Slight motion on all lumbar and lumbosacral levels, which is, you know, it's kind of semi-normal. But this is my main concern. That means the problem that he had in L5S1 is now affecting what? The surrounding areas. It's now moving up L3, L4, and L4, L5. So what kind of questions could I ask, right? Like I mentioned, what surgeries was done? What uh, views did we take? What did we, did we make him, did Myerson make him move him up and down? Which motions did we do? Both flexion and extension. Doesn't that look like a both A and B? Because what happened to the sacroiliac joint? Did it disappear? Did it, uh, did it erode? Was there herniation? No, they're well-preserved. That means they're what? They're normal. Right? Oh, do, 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 do. so, and also here, here you go. What do we see in the radiograph the, or the x ray? Or I could ask, hey, did we take an ultrasound or a CT or was it just a straight up x ray? And it's just a radiographic report. That means we just took straight up x rays. If it was a CT, it would say what? Computerized tomography, reading, yada, yada, yada. If it was ultrasound, it would say what? ultrasound uh, reading or ultrasound diagnostics. Um, eh, I wouldn't ask that, right? I could ask that. Was there a problem with L3, L4, or L4, or L3 and between L3 and L4, or lumbar three, lumbar four, lumbar four and lumbar five? Because yeah, because of the original damage in L5S1. So you could see there's a multitude of questions just with this little thing. And you don't need this. It doesn't necessarily have to be your classic history of subjective, objective assessment and plan. It could be what? A radiologic report. And that's what happens every day in the hospital. Here's another one, an operative report. So if they did um, an operation on this man's rotator cuff, Mr. Chang, uh, Chen Zhang. So Mr. Zhang, so what is uh, Dr. Anderson? What department does he belong to? The guy who did the surgery. Is he a surgeon? Yes. But what kind of surgeon? Anybody? What kind of surgeon is he? Could it be orthopedic? Yeah. And could I have a question that says, is he radiology? Is he orthopedics? Is he rheumatology? And then right off the bat, you'd know is because, wait a minute, rotator cuff, right shoulder, degenerative arthritis, rotator cuff. Oh, and tendinitis. Oh, all these other things. Now, I wouldn't put rheumatology because that's kind of tricky, but I would put what kind of surgeon is he? Cardiovascular, uh, but it's obvious that it is um, orthopedics. So your rotator cuff is in your shoulder. It's part of your supraspinatus, infraspinatus, teres minor, and your subscapularis. And all of that is in your shoulder girdle. And he also has degenerative arthritis, meaning the joint space is starting to fall apart, okay? And his right acromioclavicular joint, which is your the joint between your clavicle and your uh, shoulder blade is messed up, right? He has degenerative arthritis there. He has calcific tendinitis, that means this calcium builds up in all the wrong places and it's also on his tendon and that's giving him 
inflammation and infection of his tendon of the superior glenoid, which is, um, it's a piece of uh, your, um, uh, of your humerus of your uh, upper arm. He has early degenerative osteoarthritis of the right shoulder. And also he's, you know, a little older history of gouty arthritis. Oh, gout, worst. It is, gouty arthritis is an arthritic, arthritic condition of metabolic reasons. Um, people who have gouty arthritis, including myself, you, you can't m metabolize uric acid very well anymore. So uric acid crystals build up in the joint space and then it causes severe arthritis and severe pain. Um, gouty arthritis is what they call exquisite pain. You know, ever have a toothache and it makes your eyes squint? That's arthritis, that's gouty arthritis. It's on that same level. Anesthesia, state of condition of no feeling. Esthesi means feeling. So I could ask, what did we give to Mr. Zhang, patient Zhang, so that he won't feel anything? And you'll say xylocaine, 1%. What kind of uh, anesthetic is that? It's local, right? And we also gave him IV sedation, intravenous. So we put it where? In his vein. What do we do? Open repair of the uh, rotator cuff, open incision, outer end of the clavicle, anterior or front part of his clavicle, and plasty, we did the repair. And the sub or underneath part, we performed arthroscopy. And the bursa, which is the pocket of fluid in that area. So we not only opened them up physically, we had we scoped them as well for the for the for the joint spaces that we really can't see very well unless we have to rip up his entire shoulder a shoulder girdle, which most surgeons aren't willing to do. So what happened? I could ask, what are the findings? Or what's the uh, 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 what happened during the operation? Well they found that the superior, anterior and inferior and posterior Glenoid, part of his uh, uh, um, glenoid tuberosity, which is the, the top part of their, his upper arm, was intact. There's some fraying of the anterior portion of it, but that's okay. It was all in one piece. Long head of the biceps, also intact. That's a muscle, has two heads. There are no intraarticular calcifications, so even though they were suspecting, Calc uh, calcific tendinitis, didn't find any. We observed the takeoff of the long head of the bike. That means it works. Um, there was an osteophyte, in, um, uh, osteophyte inferiorly on the humeral head. Eh. Um, no, nah, I wouldn't ask you that. It, it's going to take me a while to explain all of this, especially if you didn't have anatomy, physiology, and um, pathology yet. Deep surface tear of the rotator cuff, posterior superior corner of the greater tuberosity. That means what? Back part, upper part, upper back part of the humerus at the infraspinatus insertion, which is part of his rotator cuff. And when you're in anatomy and physiology, you know your infraspinatus, right? Spine, the spine of your scapula, infra means in, it goes within. So that's the muscle that goes within. Extremely dense subacromial bursal scar because we had to go underneath the acromion, which is part of that acromion plasty, the repair. And there was a prominence of the inferior edge of the acromial, um, uh, acromial clavicular joint with inferior acromial clavicular joint and anterior acromial spurs. A bone spur is like extra, like uh, pieces of bone sticking out that shouldn't be there. We usually shave those down. So, there's a whole bunch of things I could ask. What kinds of words? And you could also, what type of arthritis does he have? Well, did we find any calcium deposits? What instruments did we use, right? We not only did surgery, we also scoped him. So they had to use an arthroscope. I wouldn't ask you what labra is. Um, outgrowth, outgrowth of bone? Yes, right here. A chromial spur within the acromion, which is part of your um, your clavicle. And where's your clavicle? 
it's uh, your, um, let me show you here. Here's your AC joint. This is your clavicle or your uh, collarbone. And this is like the, the spinous portion of your shoulder blade. And here's your glenoid fossa and here's your glenoid, this, this is your glenoid tuberosity of your uh, humeral bone. So this is where all that operation took place to give you guys an, you know, um, a little better understanding or view of what all that jibber jabber was a second ago. So pick one of these two cases, either that one or this one, write five multiple choice um, questions based on the case or ref that you need to refer back to the case and you should be good in your discussions. And everything else is the same. Uh, do your medical ma uh, language laboratories. Some of you already finished for the term, good on you. Um, uh, I think one or two of you already know what you're missing and probably did it already. I will catch up on grading probably tomorrow morning. Now, does anyone have any questions? I count one, two, three, four, five. And whoever's on the phone, if you could uh, um, text me your name on the uh, chat so I know it's you, so I can give you credit. Does anyone have any questions on what we need to do today and what we did today? And what does your... and and where we're going to meet next week, it's on campus. And have my um, have my number on hand just in case you're late or just in case uh, you know uh, you're not going to be there or whatnot. You know things happen, right? We're all adults. So if no one has any questions, comments, recipes. If not, I should stop this recording.